We're going to then spend some time discussing the way in which processes can communicate amongst each other. And then there's a few examples of the process communication. And then the, the, the chapter ends when it discusses communication with client server systems, because that's effectively just another form of process communication. So there's the, what I've just said, the objectives. So let's start by talking about the process itself. One of the first things that you have to understand that is that the process and the program are two different things. If I talk about a process, then it is effectively a running program. Okay, now what is a program? So obviously if you go onto your hard drive and you look at let's say the program files in here there's a bunch of programs such as Microsoft Office Oh, it wasn't there. And there. That's maybe the wrong one. Anyway, let's see if we get another better way of it. No, let's take a bunch of them. So here's a bunch of EXE files, one of them is called putty.exe, that is a program. As it is there, that .exe file is a program. But when you run it, and when it loads into your computer's memory, that becomes a process. So there's a lot more to a process than just the program itself. An operating system, um, well, in the operating system, we execute this in uh, batch system, we typically call it jobs, that gets executed. Now what is a batch system again? A batch system is typically where you have a mainframe environment, typically, I always think about banks um, or, in, or some kind of financial institution that uses these big um, calculating mainframe environments where they've got different jobs that have to run every night, where they calculate certain things, uh, Jones Group Stock Exchange, um, calculate interest rates, those kind of aspects are typically done on what we call batch systems, and that's called jobs. Time sharing systems are the operating systems that we have become used to. So those, these are the things that we typically use on personal computers, your mobile phones, laptops, um, your tablets, those are all time sharing operating systems, and then they typically are user programs that execute or are certain tasks. The quick mention there says that the textbook uses the terms jobs and processes almost interchangeably. Um, but please refer to process when we work with, uh, when we refer to it. Process consists of multiple parts. Now this is important to know and understand. A process, first and foremost, have as uh, as a text section. Now the text section is your code. And you guys have been exposed to it. So here's an example, for instance, of a, an assembly language program. And if you can remember, your assembly programs has these uh, little <coughs> things on top that typically has for instance .data and .code. Anything below .code is your text section. That is your code section. But here's a question. Can the text section in a process change? Yes. Okay, explain how. Uh, if you treat the code as a star, you can change it as a style. Okay, so he says that if you treat the code as data, then you can manipulate it while it's running. And that is true. So for instance, um, in this code, we have a number of jump example, the jump um, instructions, which you guys have been using. I think you guys used it. Yeah, you've used it now in the last prep. Now, potentially, 
you can change that label so that it jumps to maybe a different area. So you can make that label some kind of variable instead of a fixed memory location. That can be done. You can effectively change the program while it's running. However, most modern processors do not allow that to happen. The reason is, has to do with security and the stability of your program itself because potentially then these things can misbehave a little bit. So there's different mechanisms that they usually typically have on this. So your text section in most processes, I would say uh, in most modern processes, never ever changes. Once it's once you develop it, it's fixed, it's compiled, doesn't need to change anymore. Now there's another thing that I'm going to show you why that potentially um, is the case. Uh, when you execute a process, so I'm just going to start a process here, and I want to show you the memory map. Let's zoom in here. So the memory map kind of describes what happens in different sections of the memory for the specific process. So you'll see that um, you, this memory map consists of like IO.dll and then it has a text section and there's this app.dll which has a text section kernel place that has a text section some other dot text sections there um, where's my actual text? oh, it, obviously this is my actual text section that I've physically developed so the text section contains the code of your program now have this protection flags basically describes what is allowed to happen with that because it's just something that's in memory what you can do with that memory and have a look at it says E stands for executable meaning I can take data take bits and bytes in that piece of memory and I can execute what does R stand for do you think? read I can read from there but can you see there's no W here? Meaning I can't write to that section. So typically an executable component of your of your text, of your processes are executable, obviously, and they are read-only. Where if you take this section, the dot data section, and it says you see it's R, W, and C. Read, write, and change. So I can potentially read from there, write there, change whatever is in there because that is where, and if I double click this, this program actually jumps into that section and you see it actually has a lot of the strings and stuff that you typically have in your assembly program that falls, guess what, under this section. And hopefully you can see that I can put data in this memory location and that memory location and I've got some data there this thing has got a value of 50 this thing has got um, 50 uh, items or well, actually a bunch of zeros um, but it takes off 50 byte items um, this is a bunch of fixed characters that takes up space in memory and I can go ahead and I can modify that information in that section of the code. So that is your data code in your, your uh, process, that's your data section. So when, it, when we say that a process consists of different sections or different aspects, first things that you have to understand is that each process has a text section. And that is typically your code of your box, not typically, it is the code, code of your program. It also has something that you keep track of where we are kind of executing inside that program, which is your program counter. So in the Intel processor, what is the register called for the program counter? You know? So is that? EPS? Uh, no. no. Sorry. E. EAX. Now, EAX, those are what we call general purpose registers, but you can load anything in this. Yeah. EIP. EIP. 
It's the instruction pointer. So each processor has its own name for a program counter, and all that it has, it basically just stores the address of the next process on the next line of code that you're going to execute. If you don't believe me, let me again show you this. No, no, stop that thing now. So this is it. where we typically store a number of things. What are these things? Your local variables are stored on the stack. So whenever we create, we call a function, if that function has variables declared in there, they are put on the stack. When that function is finished executing, that memory is automatically taken away and given back to the rest of the running program. So your stack is something that grows and shrinks the whole time depending on how we execute our functions. Other stuff that you find on the stack is uh, locations of calling functions or where did you call the, the function from, that kind of thing. They are uh, not that's called the return addresses. There are function parameters that's there. So typically part of whenever you call a function, the parameters are also stored on the stack. The data section just showed you now, it contains your global variables. And then the heap contains your memory that dynamically is allocated during the runtime. So typically, when we have these dynamic arrays, and you use in C++ the new keyword, so that we can create more memory for our arrays, that gets put on the heap. Now we can visually represent it by using this diagram that shows you that each process has an area that contains text, contains data, which is your global variables, it has a heap that in most modern operating systems grows upwards, meaning from a low address number to a higher address number, 
and then you've got the stack which grows downwards, meaning from a high address number to a lower address number. So addresses, remember, are typically each process has a certain number of addresses associated with memory addresses from zero to whatever the maximum is, and that is in that section where it has to fit in. 32-bit processes on the Intel processor runs from memory location 0 to 2 gigabytes. 7 um, Everything above that, basically from 3 gigabytes to up to the limit of 4 gigabytes is used by the operating system. Okay, so that's why interesting again, if I run this thing, because you should still see it's there, and I, and I look at my memory map, it starts with a very low number there on the side. There we go. The low number there, from 0 to 10,000, and then it grows up to 7, if, 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 whatever. And that's basically just below the 2 gigabyte memory limit. Okay, above 2 gigabytes, that's where we get to um, 8, and then the whole bunch of zeros. So all of this stuff that you see here is memory allocated to this user process. Remember user mode and kernel mode? User processes as this memory associated to so in that input system result, I'm assuming that would be the variable for the results. I'm not sure what reserve is actually used. Um, so each operating system, the way in which it lays out this memory map is um, different. I have no idea what reserve is actually used for it. Sometimes used for memory, or for, for um, screen, stuff that you want to Post to the screen, for instance, they can reserve that for that purpose. Some of them are used for buffer space for networking. Who knows? Um, I have no idea. It's, but it's not something that we have any control of. Yes. So I said for that it's two bits from zero to two bits. Yeah. How is it the limit change Sorry? Well, there is a limit, but I'm not. So the question is, is there what is the memory? Memory availability <laughs> for 64 bit processes. I'm not going to sure what they are, but they are significantly bigger than 4 gigabytes. I think it's a, four, a few zero. I mean, the total number of memory that a 64 bit memory map can see is so big, it's, I, I don't even know what that number is. It's, if you take 64 bits and put a bunch of ones in, that's effectively how much memory you can see. It's, it's such a big number, I, I don't know what it is. Obviously, the operating system designers have decided not to go that big. Um, I think it's a few terabytes the size of your user memory space now that is available to your user process. One of the obvious questions is, is I mean, if my process can see up to 10 terabytes as a as hypothetical, but my computer only has 8 gigabytes of RAM, how does that work? How do you fit in something that's in memory location 4.333 terabytes into the 8 gigabyte RAM. Well, we'll get to that. That's part of virtual memory, which is quite cool. <coughs> anyway, alright, so that's some of the aspects that we have um, with the heap and the stack. What is also just want to mention here programs are passive, but the passive entities are. Programs, meaning executable files, a process is an active uh, component program because process really is executable files that are in memory. Executing, the execution of a program starts with when you double click your application or when you run it from the command line or anything like that. One program can be several processes. How does that mean? Yeah. Multi thread application. Multi? It's not multi threaded. Multi threaded still only have one multi threaded application like Word or Excel or whatever. They still have only one process. Let me show you. Can you see I've got one notepad there and another notepad there? If I look at Task Manager, 
and I look at the processes, I see there's two different notepads. Can you see the one has process ID of 2536 and the other one is 24664. So it's one program called notepad on ET are now two processes. That's what it is. But that should show you there's a there's, there's some there's, there's a difference between a program and a process. Obviously, there's other types of processes like Outlook that has a number of processes working together. The same with your typical web browsers, Chrome, etc. They also have multiple processes working together. Yes. The what? G. Now, what about G? Group. Is G group? Okay, so that's possible group. I don't know what that means. <laughs> what does group mean? I don't know, I just searched. So. Okay, we'll have a look. We'll see if we can find out. So, what is it possible that the G in that attributes in our memory map might be called group? Uh, maybe it's got something to do with like shared memory and stuff like that. I don't know. Alright, so that's what it's meant in this case. So consider one program can have several processes, consider multiple users executing the same program. So all of those describes it well, uh, described by these. Next, we'll talk about that. Another thing is, so we said now that a process is a running program, and we said that a process has these many aspects to it, like it has a program counter, it has an address space that it must run in, it has a data section, it has a code section, in your text section, and all of these other stuff. But the process itself is like a, an entity that changes depending on where it is in the system at the moment. So the process has or may have five different states according to this textbook. Other textbooks have only three, but this one has five. And I'm going to try and explain each one right now. So when we start a process, one of the first things that needs to happen is we need to allocate certain memory for that process. We have to allocate certain resources to that process. And only once that is finished can we start running the process. So typically when a process starts, it creates a state called new. So it has a name called new. That's the state that I'm in when I basically start. When it's finished, the operating system is finished getting all the scaffolding in place to build my process and it's now ready to run, they are then put um, into a state called the ready state. So typically from run, it typically will go into the ready state. So I am now ready. Ready basically means I'm waiting to be executed. Only one process on a uniprocessor architecture, the other terminology remember, architecture meaning the type of CPU. Uniprocessor means one processor. So on a one, one processor environment, only one process can execute at the same time. My computer is a quad core processor. So that means effectively how many processes can execute really at the same time? Or four. It's four because I've got four processors with four engines that can do the job. And that means there's four things that can go from a busy ready to a running state at once. But this Forget about the complex environment, just think about one processor at the moment. Any processor that waits for CPU time has a state called ready. When the process is currently being executed, meaning if the program counter starts reading the instruction, it executes the instruction, it then goes and fetches the next piece of memory, the instruction from memory, loads that in, executes that instruction. When that happens, when that cycle happens, that is when the process is running. I want you to listen clearly what I say when I say when a process is running, typically the pro, uh, program counter says where it must go fetch that piece of code, 
Because remember, the code is just in memory somewhere. It has to be loaded from memory into the processor. So that's typically the fetch. And then they call, they say, you decode that typically to figure out what must I now do with these instructions. And then it goes and executes the instruction. It gives you different categories of instructions. Certain instructions that does, most, that does mathematical equations. Some instructions that goes and updates memory locations. So there's different types of instructions, and that typically needs some kind of decoding for the time, and then it doesn't execute. So all of these things happen while it's running, and then it goes into the next one, you know, the next instruction, and the next one, and the next one. And then something happens. So one process, one of the unique processor system, is running, and then it's running, it's running, and then eventually it stops running, and the question is why? So there's typically a number of reasons why it might stop. The first one is that it has used up its time slots. So there's a, there's, a, there's a guy, or there's a piece of hardware in your computer. Name me one piece of hardware inside the computer. That RAM. Okay, so there's something like that. There's a bunch of controllers, remember? There's a bunch of controllers that talks to hardware. There's one special controller that runs in the background called a timer. So what is a timer? It's really just a stopwatch. And all it does is it counts down. And when that thing hits zero, what does it do? It raises an interrupt. It says, CPU, stop whatever you're doing. I'm interrupting you. You must now give the scheduler process execution time. So my notepad of ET process was running very happily, I could start typing in there, and then after a certain number of nanoseconds or milliseconds or whatever, that timer when it gets to zero, notepad of ET the process then moves from a running state into a ready state. And the thing that typically then runs is what we call the scheduler of the operating system. Now we'll talk about the job of that scheduler a little bit later on. But effectively, what that scheduler does, it then evaluates all the processes that's in a ready state. It says, you, process number one, you are ready. Process number two, you are ready. You are ready, you are ready, you are ready. Hmm, who am I going to choose that will be running next? It's kind of, he's the boss. He decides who will run next. And there's a bunch of algorithms that that scheduler can make use of to decide which process to run next. And as soon as that he decides to select the process, that process change, changes from a ready state into what state? Running. Into a running state. But there's another reason as well why processes may stop running. You are using Notepad. Blah, 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 blah. You type in a nice message, you click File Save. As soon as you click that, your process, I have to write this data to the hard disk. Now, in terms of your CPU time, that is an extremely slow process. Your CPU is a gazillion times faster than your hard disk is. So what does it do? It takes that process down from a ready state and moves it into a waiting state. Because now I have to wait until my file has finished writing to the hard disk before I can load my process back and I can give it CPU time again. And then only can I resume typing. Obviously, these things, in terms of human speed, it's like that, isn't it? Because you're typically your file is a lot smaller and it's typically a lot faster than you get response back. So, what happens if uh, program crashes? So, say, for example, it says, I know that it is stopped at one. What happens to the state? Does it carry on trying to write in the scheduler slice? Or yeah, so what happens? The question is what, what happens in the state when your program misbehaves? So, like, notepad of ETS has stopped responding, or your program has stopped responding, or has done this following illegal operation. That program was in what state? Did it get that error? It was in the running state. Then there are certain things that a process is not allowed to do. When that happens, a trap occurs, also called an interrupt, 
and the operating system then stops that process and then terminates that process. Because you can't say it's going to be dry, it's just okay and stop responding, it's done. So then it moves from a running into a terminated state and the operating system goes ahead and says, okay, you had the following memory allocated to you, give it back. You had the following this allocated to you, give it back, blah, 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 blah. You're now out of my memory. And it gives back all of these resources. Does that answer your question? It does, but then I have another question. If you choose to click wait, because sometimes it will tell you either wait or end process. If you click wait, does that just leave it in the waiting process? Yeah, so, so the question there is not so much with misbehaving processes, but <laughs> with processes that take a long time. Your operating system tries to figure out whether a process is, an inf is inside an infinite loop. It uses what they call watchdog timers and stuff like that. So that's it. This thing has now been stuck here and has, I haven't, it hasn't done anything actively. So maybe this thing is in a hunt. So do you want to wait or do you want to terminate? That's typically the two options that you have. If you say wait, it then goes back into either the running, depending on what it was doing at that point, it might either be waiting for hardware or it's physically running, meaning by just in a loop. And you can leave it running or you can go back into the waiting queue while it's waiting for hardware. So all we know is it's stuck somewhere in one of these queues or in a state and it's not changing its state for some reason. And then it depends on you of what you want to do at that point. If you say then wait, give it the state that stays the same, otherwise it's also done. Alright, so here's a little picture of typically what can cause these things to change. So remember I said that when a process gets created initially, it has a new state. Then as soon as that process has effectively all the scaffolding has been built, the operating system does that on our behalf, it goes into a ready state. Eventually when it's now picked to be uh, scheduled to execute, meaning that scheduler dispatch picks that process, it starts running. And now there's three legs, can you see that? Interrupt, exit, or waiting. That can change it from running to either a ready, waiting, or, an, or, a, or a terminal. If it's interrupted by a scheduler, then it goes back into the ready queue. If it's waiting for an IO event, or some other kind of event, then it goes into the waiting state, um, otherwise, if it exits, either terminates um, gracefully or terminates forcefully by some kind of error, it goes into the terminated state. So understand this diagram and how a process may change um, the different states between these different states. You have to know how, how this works. Now, when we what I said what, as in the beginning as well is that when a process gets created, it has to build a bunch of scaffolding. Now there's a special data um, structure that keeps, um, keeps track of everything that belongs to this process. That's called a process control block. And each operating system is different on exactly what is inside such a process control block. But there's at least a few minimum things that's typically part of this. The first thing is it's definitely the state of that process. So what is that process going to do? It be running, waiting, ready, etc. etc. It also keeps track of the program counter, meaning where, what uh, memory location have we executed or what is ready to be executed next. And it has a bunch of, it keeps track of your CPU registers, contains all the processing registers, CPU scheduling information can be put in there, memory management information, um, the accounting information, such as how much CPU time has been used, top time elapses, the start time limits, and some IO status like IO device device allocated to the process, the list of open files, etc. So this is a uh, data structure that exists per process. But this structure doesn't get updated every clock cycles. 
So typically this instruction, this, this data structure gets created initially with an initial set of aspects to it. And then every time it changes the state, either from ready to running or running to something else or waiting, the state of this structure gets updated. So think of this as your save file. When you run a pro, when you run a game, and your mother interrupts you while you're playing your game, you can press save in some games. That typically saves the state of that game into a file. And this is typically such a save file, but for each process. Keeps track of exactly the state of that process as it was. Here's a good example. We have two processes depicted in this diagram. We've got process zero and process one. Process zero was executing there on top, up to that point where an interrupt occurred or if you ran the process, maybe did a system call or something, whatever. All we have to know is that another process then starts running. So typically what happens then is the operating, insure, operating system ensures that the state of that process gets saved into the process control block belonging to that process. And then it selects the scheduler, typically goes through some things and it selects a new process, in this example of process 1. And process 1's process control block gets loaded into the various aspects, we can call the registers, gets loaded with the values they had, the files gets opened up again, the program counter points to the thing that was executed the last time, and so on and so on, and then process 1 executes in this section right here. And then eventually process 1 finishes, or something happens to it, and it gets interrupted, and then its state again is saved, and something someone else is going to be interrupted. Yes? So if the operating system has to run the CPU to execute and save the processes data, how does it do that when the process is in the CPU? Because you know the operating system, who's responsible for saving it before you put it in? Is it the hardware or? Okay, so let me see if I understand you correctly. So, you're asking if the operating system has to be in memory for it to do the saving in the CPU, in the process itself. In the CPU itself. Yeah. Yeah. It actually has to be executing and the process is inside of the CPU. Yeah. How does the CPU save its registers okay. and everything before it gets loaded to the execution? Okay. So let's let me so, so the question is when it gets interrupted. How does it know that the CPU, that the operating system must now run and what portion of the operating system that may be? Let me give you an example. So process zero was executing there on the top. Now let's assume it's the old little timer thing, okay? So the timer runs out and it raises a special interrupt to the CPU. Now there's different ways in which these interrupts can happen. One is what we call through an interrupt vector. Now an interrupt vector basically just says, which interrupt handler should run when this thing is now stopping. So the CPU physically gets the signal and says, I must stop running now and I must execute interrupt handler number, let's say one. Interrupt handler number one has a special memory allocated to it. So in the memory of your computer is, for instance, the code of the scheduler. Actually, it's an interrupt handler normally that runs first, but it starts executing that code. And in this case, it might be the scheduler. Now, one of the first things that the scheduler will do is it saves the state of the process that was running. Because at that state, nothing has changed in terms of the, um, um, the, the other aspects for the open files. The only thing that really changed at that point is the program count. The, the, the program counter gets saved by the hardware. So the hardware goes ahead and it saves the, the program counter so that eventually I can make a copy of that in the process control mode. I hope that makes or that sets the state. Then it executes the scheduler and the scheduler selects the new process control block, loads that into the system, and then says, You are now ready to run. 
It's a good question. Actually, uh, that's some of the reasons why one of the first sections um, of your interrupt uh, device drivers and so on, the interrupt handling is still assembly language code because it has to handle this low level instruction from keeping track of your program counter and that you have. Okay, guys, that's where we're going to end today. Let me just quickly get payments code, please.